All right, so um, good evening for everyone who is attending our um, virtual workshop. Um, I did want to just give a couple quick tips really quick. Um, if you are on a mobile device or an iPad and you're watching this and you wanna be able to sort of zoom into the slides that we're presenting, um, a good tip is to just, um, you can use your fingers like you normally would to zoom on your phone and you'll be able to kind of scroll around and see things a little bit more clearly. Um, we also have Amanda Hernandez, who is our Development Services Manager. She is on the call. If you have any technical difficulties, um, her phone number is there below. Um, and we'll also walk you through another tool to uh, talk to her, which is our Q&A um, function as well. All right. And so um, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all very much for joining us this evening um, for our second virtual workshop to discuss downtown design guidelines and architectural standards. Uh, my name is Andrea Villalobos. I'm the senior planner for the city of San Marcos. And um, again, this is our second virtual workshop. So for those of you all who attended the first workshop this summer, um, thanks for joining again and staying involved in the, in the process. If this is your first workshop as part of this project, um, we'll be doing a recap um, here in a minute of our past project outreach, our events, and feedback we've received this year, so you'll be able to kind of get caught up on the project. And um, the first thing we wanted to do is just introduce um, the Q&A function during this meeting. It's one of the tools we'll be using. So if you're on a mobile device or an iPad, um, you can just tap your screen and the Q&A function should pop up um, for you at the bottom. If you're on a computer, um, it should already sort of be at the bottom of your screen. So the next step is essentially to ask a question. Um, if you just click on that ask a question button, um, you'll be prompted to type in your question. Um, and we certainly encourage you to use this function throughout the meeting to ask any questions. Um, or request uh, clarification on standards, how they might be applied, or even if you have you know, technical or procedural questions. So please feel free to use it. Um, we'll either answer your question immediately or we'll save them for the end um, so we can go over it a bit more in depth and explain the answers to the full list of workshop participants. Um, lastly, you'll also have the opportunity at the end of the meeting um, before we um, before we move into some of our polling questions, you'll have the opportunity to actually virtually raise your hand. Um, so this will give you the ability to actually talk um, live using your microphones if you'd like to do that. Um, you can also use the Q&A, of course, but it is just another option that you'll have um, at the very end. And so you'll have a virtual raise your hand button on your um, on your uh, device. And so we'll be able to see that and we can sort of allow you to talk at that time. So just keep these two options in mind as we go through the presentation, if you've got questions or need any assistance. So um, the next thing that we're actually gonna do is practice the other interactive feature we'll be using tonight. Um, so at the very end of the uh, presentation, we'll have a few uh, polling questions to get some initial feedback from you all. So um, in a second, I'm going to launch the poll. So you'll see a poll window pop up on your screen, and then there'll be three questions that you're asked. Uh, if you're on an iPhone or uh, an iPad or a phone, you're gonna hit next at the bottom to get through the three questions. If you're on a computer, uh, typically you can just scroll down and or you might actually see all three questions um, sort of on your screen. So um, if you're having any issues, again, we've got Amanda Hernandez's email there for you. Um, and phone number and so you can certainly um, see if you can reach her as well. So I'm going to go ahead and just start our poll now. All right, so you should see the poll started now and um, you can start to uh, submit your answers. These are just questions to kind of practice the poll, but they're also helpful for us to sort of understand how many individuals are on the meeting um, and what device you're using. 
and we'll wait just a few more moments. We've got a few individuals who still need to answer this one. Just want to make sure everyone's able to utilize it. We've got a few new attendees as we're taking this poll. You're joining us right as we're practicing a poll. Uh, so there's three questions here. If you don't mind just answering them for us. We do have a request to leave this one open for just a few seconds. It looks like we may have some participants that are having some, some issues. We might also try to end polling and just give it another shot. If people are coming in late, it may give them an error message. Sure, we can do that. I'm gonna go ahead and end it and then just restart it as a practice. Okay, let's try it one more time. If you've already submitted, you get an extra practice round with the three questions. Keep it open for a few more moments. So just got a couple that still waiting to answer. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end this one. And I think also if you're if you're joining us, I know we've had a lot of individuals join us while the poll is being launched. Um, so that might have been part of the challenge, but um, we'll be doing these towards the very end of the meeting. So um, just keep that in mind. We'll have a couple questions at the end that we will be asking you through the, the polling feature. All right, so um, thank you again for, for helping us uh, with that exercise. Um, and thank you guys for um, participating again in this workshop for everyone that's just joined. Um, so next I'm gonna present our uh, meeting presenters tonight. So in addition to myself, we have Nori Winter, um, who is the principal of Winter and & Company, and Marsha Boyle, um, who is the associate planner and designer for the project. Nori and Winter are our consultants on this project, and so um, they'll be presenting a lot of the recommendations to the design standards and guidelines today. Winter and Company uh, has experience in urban design and preservation across the country and has worked locally in Texas, including Galveston, Houston, San Antonio, and Plano. Uh, and actually, Winter and Company worked with us back in 2012 originally to um, write our, our standards that we wrote back in 2012. Um, so we're really excited that we've got to work with them again, um, and their knowledge of San Marcos has been really valuable um, as we move through this update process. Um, lastly, we do have Amanda Hernandez as well. I've mentioned um, she's our Planning Development Services uh, Manager, and um, she'll be sort of monitoring that Q&A feature that we went over at the beginning. Um, if you're just joining us, uh, if you have a question, whether it's a technical question, a procedural, if you want um, a question about what the material we're presenting or how it's applied, please feel free to use the Q&A function. We'll be monitoring that throughout the meeting. So um, just want to go over a couple of our meeting objectives objectives. Um, so today we are going to talk about downtown San Marcos architectural design standards and guidelines. Um, that's our purpose here today. So we'll first review the project process to date to give you some background on really how we got here. Next we'll cover really the bulk of the meeting which is to present the recommendations for the update to the standards which are in the development code and the guidelines which are in our design manual. So really focusing on two documents um, tonight. 
We'll conduct some polling questions again at the end, and then we'll talk a little bit about a follow-up survey that we'd like for you all to participate in um, at the end of the survey. In terms of just overall um, timing, we'll spend about 45 minutes on the bulk of the presentation, about 15 minutes conducting the polling activities, and then we'll give some time for discussion and questions, and then the last few minutes we'll go over our next steps. And so I wanted to um, really just set the stage for how we got here, especially for individuals who um, are just joining us as their first workshop tonight. So we first began our downtown design journey in San Marcos by adopting design guidelines and architectural standards in 2012. The purpose of creating these standards was to regulate the architectural design of buildings or essentially the look and feel of buildings um, to an extent in our downtown. Um, these standards are used when new construction, redevelopment, or exterior remodels occur within the downtown area. The standards focused on a couple of key areas. Foremost, they were context specific, meaning that the standards or guidelines, they might look differently in different parts of downtown. They also created guidelines for special cases when an applicant might want to request something different or something unique that was not originally allowed in the standards and so they would go through um, sort of a separate process to request something different. Tonight, as we talk about um, downtown, we're really talking about this map here, which is our downtown boundary. It extends from Texas State University down to I-35 and then extends to the left and the right in various ways. Within this boundary, we have some sub boundaries, um, which are those sort of design contexts I mentioned in that there might be different standards or different intents for different parts of downtown. And so you'll notice University Edge, Residential Transition Edge, Downtown, these are existing design contexts. I do want to note that um, later in the presentation, we'll actually talk about some updates to this map and um, updates to the naming of it based off of some of the community input we received um, earlier uh, this summer as part of the project. The other thing um, you might be wondering is why the boundary looks this way. Um, and really the answer is generally um, that it follows a couple of key zoning districts uh, that are downtown in San Marcos. So, if you're a resident in St. Marcus, you most likely have um, what's called a zoning district designation on your property. Um, these are things like single family, mixed use, duplex, um, apartments, so on. Zoning, it essentially determines what kinds of things you can build in different parts of town. So in San Marcos, we actually have 33 different zoning districts in St. Marcus. And so this map here really shows one of them, which is our character district 5D zoning. It's essentially everything that you see in purple is our character district 5D zoning. Um, in that zoning district, you can do uh, apartments, you can do townhomes, mixed use buildings. Um, those are some of the building types that are allowed in that sort of purple area. Within the map, there's also some areas that aren't zoned CD5D, and so they, they aren't purple, and you can somewhat see the brown color underneath, um, which still indicates that it's the downtown. Uh, so these properties are they're either going to be parks or open space or they might have a zoning district that's somewhat one step down from our character district 5D, um, which means that it you know, might permit less density or less height, that kind of a thing. So um, just generally know that the boundary is established um, kind of based off of some, some components that are, um, that are involved with the zoning. So the next thing I wanted to bring up just before we get started is that in and around our downtown context boundary, we also have two historic districts. The first is the downtown historic district, which surrounds the courthouse, and it's actually outside of our downtown context boundary. And you can, you can see it there in the center. It's um, the white area underneath that's got the blue hash. So that's our downtown historic district. And then um, the other historic district we have is the Dunbar Historic District. And you'll notice that um, sort of blue striped area actually overlaps some of the downtown context area. Uh, so these historic districts, they actually have their own um, unique set of regulations. And so for the purposes of this project, we won't specifically be addressing the historic regulations in those areas um, for those historic districts. 
However, we will be drawing from some of the historic design traditions of those areas. Um, so you'll see some of that reflected in many of the recommendations that we'll present tonight. And then um, really, we wanted to bring up in 2018 that the city adopted a new development code. So you'll hear us talk about development code a lot um, in this presentation. And so in the development code, the original standards and guidelines from 2020 were essentially transferred over to the development code, as well as the design manual, which is the second document that you'll hear us reference tonight. The design manual is essentially an appendix to the development code, and it's got um, a lot of different um, items that we'll talk about this evening. And then finally, um, we are here today and that we're working on an update to those existing standards and guidelines as directed by our city council. So some key things we focused on in the recommendations that we're presenting to you tonight are really to include new standards to address design issues identified by you, the community, incorporate new graphics, and to make sure that the standards are tailored to various parts of downtown. Something to keep in mind uh, this evening is that we'll pre be presenting an overview of recommendations, um, but we certainly encourage you to dig into the recommendations further. Uh, we have the full red line documents, so that development code and design manual, those two documents, uh, we've got those in red line form on our website. And so we'll be getting into this a little bit um, further um, during the follow-up survey, which we'll discuss at the end, but I'm really just keep in mind we're really highlighting some of the, the key changes that we wanted to bring up and get some input on tonight. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to um, Marcia, who will be talking about the project process to date. Great, thank you. Um, so as Andre mentioned, we have had an initial round of outreach. We wanted to give a quick recap of that before we dive into the actual recommended changes to the standards and guidelines. So on the next slide, you'll see just a high level timeline of what we've done so far in this project. So from April to July of this year, we did our initial round of outreach and some of you all may have participated in that initial um, public meeting or public survey. We then took all those, all that feedback and put it into the draft recommendations, which is what we're presenting this week. So we have a series of meetings this week and we're looking forward to getting all the different feedback on the recommendations at this stage. On the next slide, you'll see that list of initial meetings that we did back in the spring and summer. You can see that we had three focus group meetings to kick the project off. Then we had an online community survey and that was really high level at that point. We asked some general questions about successes that you've seen recently in development downtown, maybe issues that have come up or just design topics that you hope to see addressed um, during this project. And then from there, we went a little deeper with the Planning and Zoning Commission and City Council in a joint workshop and discussed the initial thoughts about direction we would go for the different design topics. And then back in July, we had a virtual community workshop that also went in more depth and that was followed by a survey and that, if you participated in either one of those, you'll probably remember a series of models that we brought up in each of those to really get a feel for whether certain heights were appropriate in the, the downtown or the design context specifically. Also regarding massing and articulation, we asked some of those questions in a more specific way at that stage to then take your feedback and bring it into the recommendations. <clears throat> On the next slide, you can see some common feedback that we received from each of the different outreach methods in that initial round of outreach. You can see that the historic buildings and compatibility with historic buildings is something that everybody recognized as very important throughout the entire downtown in each of the contexts. We also heard a lot about the importance of new development being designed for San Marcos, not for another community in Texas or another community somewhere else in the country. So keeping in mind the San Marcos context is key. Incorporating more effective transitions to residential areas was also something that people brought up a lot to make sure that high density is transitioning down to existing single family residential buildings. More appropriate massing and articulation was also discussed quite a bit and designing for the pedestrians, so making sure that the 
street edge is interesting, that there's active spaces, that there's shade, and that businesses can really take advantage of those spaces. You can see on this page too that there's an intro page from four different summaries that we did for each of those initial outreach methods. We're not expecting you to be able to read them on this slide, but all of those PDFs are available on the project website. So if you're interested in reading more about the details from each of those events, you can go there to read more about it. So on the next slide, we just have our overall um, approach to what we're doing this week in our current outreach methods. So yesterday we started with a joint focus group meeting that we held virtually as well. And that was a combination of all three of those focus groups from the previous slides. And so we got their initial feedback on the first round of recommendations. Then we're presenting tonight to you all and we'll present tomorrow to the Planning and Zoning Commission and the City Council in a joint workshop. And as Andrea mentioned, after this workshop tonight, tomorrow there will be a um, ongoing community survey that opens up and you'll have till the 21st to take that. So we'll get some initial feedback tonight using the poll feature, but we also really encourage you to take the online survey because there will be a lot more opportunities to add in more comments and more details in your responses. So with that, we will move into the actual recommendations and this is really just the initial presentation of the recommended changes that we're providing to both documents that Andrea mentioned, the development code and the design manual. Keep in mind that this is going to be a high level presentation. We're not getting into all the details of every single recommendation. We just want to make sure that before you dive into the online survey, you get a better understanding of what you're looking at in the documents. On the next slide, you'll see just a quick look at what those documents are going to look like if you open up the full PDFs. You can see on both pages, the development code on the left and the design manual on the right, that there's a lot of color happening. So the red shows what was there before and that we're recommending is removed. And in most cases, that red text is also accompanied by blue text that shows what the recommended text is. So in most cases, we are recommending a replacement of text or just adding a whole new section of text or a new paragraph to clarify something, but that color combination will happen on most pages of, of the documents. You'll also see a lot of new graphics. Um, on the left, you can see that there's three different models on that page. There's models throughout. There are lots of diagrams and other illustrations to help clarify both documents. And that's also something we'll want to get your feedback on tonight and in the online survey to make sure that those graphics are really helping to illustrate and clarify the documents. So on the next slide, just as a quick reminder, Andrea went through the different design contexts and how this boundary was formed. But as we go through the recommended changes, just keep in mind that those apply to the downtown. So keep these five design contexts in mind. We'll talk about them in a little bit. Um, as far as what the changes have been that we're recommending, but this is where our standards and guidelines apply. <clears throat> so the first of the standards that we're going to talk about, I'll go, go through some design standards and then I'll turn it over to Nori for the guidelines portion. But the standards, the first one we want to talk about is varied massing. We heard a lot about varied massing in the initial outreach and people wanted to make sure that the mass of new buildings is one, respectful to historic buildings, that it's relating to the historic context, and that it's not too overwhelming in the different design contexts. So this is an existing piece of the code and we're just recommending changes to the text in this piece. You can see here that the context is that this is required in that CD5D zone district in our, our map where a building, a new building, is going to be taller than three stories and wider than 60 feet. So that's where it's required. And so what we have not changed when it gets applied, we've just changed how it gets applied. So instead of just making this section focus on the upper stories as it previously did, we're extending this to be a look at the full height of a building. Um, in the models to the right, you can see what the existing options are. So if a new development 
is proposing that it's going to be taller than three stories and wider than 60 feet. Right now, it has the developer has the option of either setting back 40% of the building that's over three stories at least 20 feet, as you can see in that existing code option one at the top, or the developer could choose to step back 50% of the building facade over three stories 15 feet. So those are the two options right now. And as you can see in those models, it's focusing on the upper stories and how you, you move around those fourth and fifth stories um, to vary the massing and make the building appear to be smaller. On the next slide, you can see what our third option and the, what we're recommending gets added into this requirement is. So the two options that exist are shown on the left there and on the right, you can see that the third option incorporates both an upper story step back like we saw in options one and two, as well as a um, setback at the ground floor. So the text reads that a minimum of 40% of the building over three stories is stepped back, a minimum of 15 feet that you can see there on the right in that circle. And a minimum of 50% of the building is set back a minimum of 10 feet from the property line. And that's shown in the circle towards the left hand side of that model. So I know that's a lot of numbers. Um, essentially, what we're trying to show here is that is the importance of, of moving both the upper stories and the ground floor. So this new recommendation is providing an option to developers to do both. And these are still just options. A developer will have the choice of option one, two, or three if their building qualifies um, and is required to incorporate this varied massing requirement. The next page you can see we move on to the expression elements. And this is a tool that's used to satisfy the blank wall area requirements. That's another design topic that's in the document and we're not going to go over the specifics on the blank wall area requirements, but essentially incorporating expression elements helps to minimize the blank wall area. You can see on the right that we've incorporated some new graphics. The graphics for cornice, wall notch, and vertical or horizontal expression line are shown on this slide. There's an additional one that is also in this set of options. And our recommend, recommended change to this design topic is that we will increase the required number of expression elements applied on a primary facade, which is typically the facade that faces the main street. We'll increase that from one to two. So previously a developer could say just incorporate a cornice, but now we're saying that a developer must incorporate a cornice and a wall notch, for instance. They can pick which of the four they want to incorporate, but the key is that they're incorporating more. And we're also requiring that one of the, these options be incorporated for a secondary facade. We'll talk in a little bit about how alternative compliance is used with expression elements, um, and that's shown in the design manual. So we'll get to that topic in a little bit here. The next topic that we wanna introduce is the forecourt. This was another topic that we discussed quite a bit in the initial round of outreach. And sometimes it came up as the discussion topic of forecourt and other times people wanted to see more outdoor space. And this is one way that a developer could incorporate more outdoor space at the ground level while still making sure to vary the massing and satisfy those blank wall area requirements. So you can see that on the right, there's some new graphics that go with this. We've updated the dimensions for forecourt to be a maximum of 50 feet. Be before it was a maximum of 35 feet. So that dimension has been updated. There's also a new standard that requires the forecourt to be at least 10 feet deep so that that space is actually usable. They can put some tables out there, chairs, maybe a rack of clothing for a business that wants to use it in that way but essentially we just wanna make sure that that space is functional. So the graphics were updated for this design topic as well as the definition and some of the standards. Then our final topic for the design standards that we wanna introduce is the neighborhood transitions focusing specifically on the contextual height step down. And this one has a few different slides. So we'll start with this map and the map essentially shows where a 
neighborhood or where a contextual height step down is required. The sites that are shown in blue on this map are the sites that require a contextual height step down. And this is because of their proximity to a historic landmark, which are noted in the um, stars on this map. The historic districts, which are noted in the dashed black lines or the um, single family residential districts that exist right now. And those are shown in that pale yellow color. So if a property is adjacent to or across the street from one of those three types of properties, then they are required to use this contextual height step down. And this map will, it has been updated from what is currently in the code and it could continue to be updated in the future based on any zoning changes, any additional historic landmark designations or historic district designations. On the next slide, you can see a couple different pages from this section of the code. One key thing that um, we're, we're doing to make the use of the code easier, but you may not realize if you're not used to digging into the code, is just that this location of the topic will move, um, which will help developers see all the standards in one spot instead of having to flip around the document a little bit more to understand this standard. And again, we're focusing on the contextual height step down standards for this section. There are other components that we've not made recommended changes to. So we're only focusing on the page that shows on the right there on this slide. On the next slide, you can see the first part of the recommendations to this section. Like I said, there are properties that are adjacent to a sensitive site and properties that are across the street from a sensitive site. So we've split those standards and we're gonna discuss them separately, although the recommendations are fairly similar for both. So the first thing that we'll show on the left here is the existing requirement. So right now it's required that after the third story, a property that is adjacent to a sensitive site must step back a minimum of 25 feet. So you can see that the fourth and fifth stories that are adjacent to that sensitive site step back 25 feet. You can see Andrea moving her mouse there to point that out. And while this is a good start, it still allows for quite a long building wall that could be right up against that sensitive site. So we've recommended two potential options for a developer to select from if their property is adjacent to a sensitive site. The first option is that a 10 foot, a minimum of a 10 foot setback that happens at the ground level occurs from that shared property line. You can see that upper story step back is still happening, but the setback helps create a little bit of a buffer. In this case, it's being used for some outdoor seating, um, probably some business entrances as well. There's some awnings along there and then some landscaping. So that helps to create a visual and physical buffer between the new building, new development and the sensitive site. The second option that a, develop, a developer could select <clears throat> is to use a step back again, but this time it occurs after the second story rather than the third story. It's not required in this one that the entire third, fourth, and fifth stories are stepped back. But here you can see at the corner that 25% of anything above two stories must be stepped back a minimum of 25 feet. So from that perspective view on the bottom there in option two, you can see that that step back is helping to step the building down towards the sensitive site to make it a little bit more compatible with, with what's already there. So on the next slide, we're gonna see four different models. We're moving into the recommendations for a property across the street from a sensitive site. And I'll just introduce the existing requirement um, on this one, and then we'll move into some larger views of each of these so it's easier to, to see all the different options. But the existing requirement, and actually I guess we could go on to the next slide since it's blown up a little bit there too. The existing requirement in this one Again, we're across the street from a sensitive site now. So you can see that the building is stepped back again at the upper stories. After the third story, the fourth and fifth are stepped back. Here it's stepped back a minimum of 12 feet. And that's something that we will ask for your feedback on. And probably not tonight in the polling questions, we won't get to that level of detail, but 
in the survey, online survey, we do ask that um, level of detail. And so you'll see that 12 foot step back in the existing requirement. It's also shown in the middle there as the entire building being, being set back by 12 feet. And so in that case, the whole building then can just build straight up. So it could be like this, where it's shown to be a five story building straight after the 12 foot setback. So that's our existing requirement. We have three different options for developers in this case. The first is a similar 10 foot setback where essentially the building across the street from the sensitive site is set back a minimum of 10 feet. And you can see in this option as well that it's being used for tables and chairs, landscaping and other entrances, but helps to create a little bit of a buffer between the height of a new development and the sensitive site. On the next slide, you'll see the second and third options for a property across the street from a sensitive site. We're in option two, we're using a similar 25% step back after the second story. You can see on the corners in this option two that that's where that 25% step back is being applied. And again, that's a 25 foot step back. And I guess I forgot to mention too that part of our recommendation is that we're increasing the upper story step back after the third story from 12 feet to 25 feet. So that was shown in option one and it's shown as well in options two and three. We wanna make sure that there's enough step back to make a difference um, even though this is across the street. So here in option two, we're showing a 25 foot step back at the um, third story for 25% of the building at those two corners. And then after that at the third story is 25 feet as well. And then our third option for a new development across the street from a sensitive site is to incorporate a forecourt. You can see that in the center there and essentially the same forecourt standards would be applied. You can see that after the third story that 25 foot step back is also being applied here. But this essentially provides one more option for a development across the street from a sensitive site. So again, it's a lot of numbers, but in the um, document, you can read through each of these in a little bit more detail and there will be some survey questions on the online survey that ask you about each of these options and whether you think they're appropriate um, recommendations for a new development across the street from a sensitive site. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nori and he's going to go over the recommendations to the design manual. Thanks, Marcia. Good evening. One of the key things we heard was that new development should be respectful of the traditional design patterns and ways of building downtown, but clearly not to imitate historic buildings, but to learn from them, part of which is the palette of materials, the height of storefronts, the modules that the individual buildings express in terms of facades that have a dimension of of a <clears throat> sort of familiar spacing from 25 to 50 feet wide. And we conducted a fair amount of analysis of the historic buildings within the historic district with the idea that we would learn from them and in, that would inform the guidelines as well as the standards. That particularly related to understanding the buried massing standards that Marcia alluded to and, and introduced you to some of the changes that are being recommended. The next slide illustrates how those kinds of varied massing techniques might play out in reality. And so there, the guidelines here are intended to help in the interpretation of the standards and in terms of helping to visualize the expected outcomes. So that step back and the way in which it might be effective is illustrated here as well as some, uh, some of the other techniques for varied massing. These are reflecting the same step back requirements and varied massing requirements that are shown in the, that are, are set forth in the code it, itself. Uh, there also then is additional guidance related to expression elements. Now those are the ones that are a little bit more superficial, although they do have some depth to them and they work in concert with the varied massing standards. And the, as Marcia mentioned now, the recommendation is that at least a building have two of those at a minimum. 
So the guidelines illustrate more specifically what those elements would be like. What they again help to do is to break up the massing on the, of the surface of a building into smaller components that reflect the widths and heights and horizontal lines that we see in the historic district and on the traditional buildings in the area. In addition to that, though, we're also introducing some alternatives that you will see on the next slide that offer an additional palette of expression elements. So in addition to the ones that are mandated in the code and that have specific measurements, there are three others that are being introduced here that uh, relate to slight variations in, in cornice heights, variations in color, and variations in material. Now these are harder to quantify, so we're not recommending that they be placed in the code because they require a certain amount of review and therefore they're in the guidelines that if a developer would seek to use one of these as an alternative to the ones that are, uh, that are by right, that option is available and it uh, provides an opportunity to look at a finer grain level of, of design. We also recognize and heard that there was a concern about buildings being perceived on all four sides, not just the facade. Particularly the larger buildings begin to be visible from many places, uh, particularly with smaller buildings around them. And so some additional guidance related to the concept of four-sided design is being introduced. And that is that the same techniques for expression of using those horizontal and vertical lines and small wall offsets, et cetera, to provide articulation to a building facade could be applied to not just to the front, the primary wall, but to secondary walls on side streets and even to the rear of a building that might be along an alley. And so this just shows a couple of those different wall conditions and a discussion about how those expression elements and varied massing might uh, relate to those different site conditions when thinking about four-sided design. Another aspect of relating to <coughs> four-sided design and to varied massing is to think about views. We heard a lot of, of concern about maintaining views to historic landmarks and uh, to uh, noteworthy buildings and places uh, in the downtown. And so we've added some design guideline material that helps to illustrate how you might take that into consideration as you plan for how you might meet the varied massing requirement that is in the code. Uh, on the upper image, you see an example of a new building. It is meeting the varied massing requirement in that it has a portion of its building stepped back at the third floor. In this case, it's in the middle of the building, and that might be where it needs to be programmatically. But if there's the opportunity to move that step-down portion to the end of the building that's closest to a sensitive site or a landmark, there's, you see that the view in this case to a church steeple begins to open up more because of the location of where that third story element is. The other alternative is using the setback requirements to actually create a corner plaza, which even opens up the view more. So this is an illustration of some guidance that shows how you might make best use of the standards in terms of how they can fit the specific context and some of the landmark structures around it. Another topic that we're addressing is that of neighborhood transitions and Marsha introduced the standards related to varied massing. But there are also are situations in which there's a space between the primary building and a sensitive edge, particularly the backside of residential neighborhoods. And so this section provides illustrations of how one might work best with that transition in a way that 
moves mass or makes use of some compatible uses along that back edge in this case. So this is an illustration of a couple of those uh, opportunities. One is a basic landscape buffer, and there are standards elsewhere in the code for the buffer itself, and how parking might be used as a separator, but again, buffered from the sensitive edge of the residential neighborhood. And another one is an illustration of the use of, of enclosing some of those parking spaces into smaller garages, such that they might help to visually buffer the backside of the primary building, and also kind of reflect the rhythm of spacing of secondary structures that exist in the, in the residential neighborhood. And there are some other examples provided in the design guidelines that relate to that as well. And then another topic that we heard a lot about is that of building materials, and particularly the use, encouraging the use of masonry as a primary building material, because of course that's so much a part of the historic tradition uh, in the downtown core. And that's often seen as brick, sometimes as stone, and sometimes as, as detailed stucco. So we've added illustrations of the different building materials that would be appropriate, and then added notations about which of those sub areas, those design contexts, they would be most appropriate in. So the next slide shows an example of a part of this visual palette, if you will, of, of primary masonry materials and examples of them. This, is, this will help designers and property owners as well as staff in interpreting when uh, it's appropriate to consider material change as one of those alternative expression elements or in some areas where material can be regulated uh, that these would help in determining uh, which materials would be appropriate. The next slide shows uh, a, a discussion of some of the other alternative materials that can be used and where they would be most appropriate. So in some cases, you'll see that these are recommended as secondary materials throughout the downtown. But in other cases, there is more specificity about a particular material such as siding and that it would be most appropriate in that western downtown area because that's the edge that is abutting single family neighborhoods and residential historic districts. So we've provided that finer grain of detail, if you will, in the building materials palette. And on the next slide, you'll see an example of, of that where recognizing that contemporary materials certainly are welcomed in the downtown, but uh, indicating where they would be most appropriate and generally as secondary materials so that that masonry palette is the one that is predominant. Finally, there are a series of design guidelines that relate to the character of the street edge. And you'll see more of those when you look at the full draft. They uh, address ways in which you can create visual interest and a sense of scale at the street edge and several of those have to do with when walls are placed right at the sidewalk edge. And this is an example of that, where there are a series of alternatives for addressing blank walls, which are, are uh, limited in the code itself. And this is one example where use of a canopy to provide shade and to, to break up the surface is an alternative for creating that pedestrian friendly interest. In the design guidelines themselves, you'll also see a variety of options for situations where buildings are set back from the street already. And there's a question of how that can be activated or animated. We heard in the earlier workshops that some of the favorite projects recently were actually adaptive reuse projects that had activated that setback in really creative ways. And so there are new guidelines and illustrations that help to uh, provide information about those kinds of treatments as well. So that's an overview of the design guidelines. Again, they work hand in glove with the standards. In some cases, they help to interpret them or show what the expected quality is. 
And in other cases, they're used for this concept of alternative compliance that we've been discussing. And that is provided for in the code so that there's flexibility for many of the design requirements when you can use the guidelines to determine that that alternative still meets the intent of the standard. It's not waiving or excusing one from meeting that standard, but it's providing alternative ways of achieving the same objective. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Andrea. Great, so I think- Or Marcia, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, we're gonna just take a quick pause and Andrea had mentioned using that raise hand feature earlier tonight. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask at this time before we get into the polling questions that we'll do, um, feel free to raise your hand or use the Q&A feature, whatever you'd like to do. And we'll pause here. I know it can take a second to type everything out, um, but if you would like to raise your hand, you can do that as well. Um, and we'll be able to essentially allow you to talk. We won't see your videos. We don't have the capability to do that, but you will be able to, um, uh, to talk using your microphone and sort of ask your question so the group can hear it. We have a question in the Q&A that says, what type of enforcement will there be for these standards, standards in quotes. So maybe we talk about standards versus guidelines. Sure, um, so the standards themselves are what is in the development code. Uh, so the standards are actually reviewed anytime a new construction permit or um, a remodel or a redevelopment, really anything that is, um, that is something that requires a building permit. So those come through the city and um, they're required to get permits for those. And so that's something that is reviewed by staff um, without, um, and they'll have to essentially meet all of the code requirements um, no matter what in order to get their permit. So um, that's really how standards um, are gonna be addressed um, in the code. And so those will be requirements. Uh, we've got one more question. Um, so uh, thank you for all of these details. Um, I'm wondering who ultimately decides which option a developer uses. Um, does each developer get to choose their favorites? So we do have, um, uh, you're correct in that there are options. Um, right now is currently written and, and is currently in the code now and with our recommendations. We are allowing the uh, developer to choose. So in some cases, there's two options that they can choose to do, or there's three options. And so that's really the way that we've set it up um, to kind of provide some flexibility, but we wanna ensure that all of the options um, do still meet the intent of of our code and so that they, you know, address what we need them to. Um, we've got another question of what if the building guidelines are not followed? Uh, and uh, Nori touched a little bit on this and we can kind of um, expand about uh, really how the guidelines uh, supplement the standards. And, and Nori, if you want to provide just some guidance on, on really the guidelines and how they work with the standards as well. Well, yes, and in terms of, uh, uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, generally they will kick in when a developer is seeking an alternative to meeting the base standard. But there are cases in which staff will use them in interpreting whether or not the base standard has been adequately met. So in either case, they can become a condition of that permit just as the as meeting the base standards are uh, and therefore it, part, it becomes a part of the condition of what is permitted to be built after that enforcement and monitoring is of course a separate step during construction to confirm that in fact the guidelines and standards have been complied with Right, thanks, Nori. 
We have another question about um, really just addressing the use of materials. Um, you know, that some materials are cheaper than others, um, such as um, stucco rather than masonry. And so, um, you know, how, how would we handle really the use of building materials? So I do wanna touch on that a little bit. Um, and it is a kind of something new that occurred um, in the Texas legislature pretty recently. Um, so building materials in Texas um, have somewhat changed in terms of what cities have the ability to regulate. Um, in this case, because we're in the downtown area, we um, can regulate building materials in several different areas, things like our historic districts, our main street um, boundary, which is a, a boundary um, sort of in and around our downtown. Um, so there are some areas where we can regulate this. Um, one of the things that the Texas legislature did change though very recently was um, cities do, um, no longer have the ability to regulate materials um, across the city. There's very specific instances. And so we, you know, we uh, understand this. And so we're really trying to adjust to um, ensure that our, our building materials are um, provide good guidance for if you're in the main street boundary and um, what you would be required to do. Um, in other areas, they, um, they're advisory. So if um, someone is going to ask for an alternative compliance, and, and Nori and Marsha touched on this a little bit, an alternative compliance is something um, in that a developer, an applicant wants to do um, something that's different in the standards. So that uh, approval process actually goes to the Planning and Zoning Commission to approve those kinds of requests and sometimes also the city council, depending on those requests. So at that time, uh, we would really be using the, the new uh, guidelines and, um, and really recommendations of the materials during that time to state, um, think about what types of materials are being used and what parts of downtown. So as Nori mentioned in that table, we've recommended that some materials are more appropriate in let's say, west downtown or the downtown core than they might be in a different area. So that's really where we would be using those. Let's see here, I have a couple more questions. Um, one of them was just, are we providing um, too many options on materials? Um, this is uh, maybe something Nori can recommend. I think it's really about providing flexibility, but ensuring that um, you know, we're able to provide something that we've heard that the community does desire while, while also um, really, really trying to fit within the Texas legislature's uh, new regulation about how cities can enforce um, materials. Um, so we have provided, you know, a palette of options and that might fit in different areas. Well, yeah, um, a couple of things. One is that the, the code does have language in it already, which says that, that the primary material of a building needs to have demonstrated durability. And that, of course, is one main consideration here in terms of some of the materials that might be of concern. The other is we went through them pretty quickly, but uh, the, the, the text associated with some of those alternative materials gets pretty specific about where they would be considered to be appropriate. Again, where that can be regulated varies depending on whether we're in the Main Street or Historic District is one condition, in which case then there is some ability to regulate that. The second option, as Andrea has mentioned and, and I've talked about, is that if I'm asking to use material as a means of expression that is of varying the surface of the building, then we get to look at that material to say, is that really effectively meeting the intent of that expression requirement? It's not saying, no, it can't be brick or not, but does it meet that requirement? So we, we do have a certain degree there of being able to review the material uh, where that alternative compliance is being requested, even when it is outside of the boundaries within which there is the power to regulate it. Thanks, Nori. Sort of on that same um, topic of, uh, of building materials, um, a question was whether we can offer incentives to developers for using desirable materials. Um, 
there are certainly uh, various ways and um, applications that a developer might be submitting for. Uh, so Nori sort of touched on if there is a change of material that is being requested as a um, as an expression tool. So instead of doing that wall notch or one of those pieces, a developer can actually request to do a change in material. And at that time, we would be able to look at the material a little bit more finely to um, start to negotiate and, and figure out what in our gui what our guidelines are saying about what material should be there. Um, so that's just one way that we've somewhat addressed it as part of this process. Uh, we had another question. Um, are the current options being replaced or simply supplemented with the ideas presented tonight? Um, so I guess stepping back to uh, what we're presenting tonight is really just our first recommendation. So um, these are not, um, we want to essentially refine all of the things that we're recommending based off of the input that we received from the community. Um, again, we've got our, we had our focus group meetings yesterday. We have our community workshop now and, and it is actually ongoing. So if anyone missed this workshop, we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll have this um, video um, open and individuals can watch the video and take the survey. We'll have the follow-up survey at the end of this where we'll get some more ideas and then we'll really kind of go back to the drawing board and, and figure out what where we might need to change um, different pieces. Um, so that is our really our first recommendation and then we'll present our um, final recommendations um, later on in the year in, in 2021. And so um, Really, there's if you dig into the, the development code and the design guideline to your question of supplemented, there's a lot of new additional pieces we've added. Um, really, the majority of it is all new standards, new guidelines, um, some revisions, but a lot of it is um, additional materials. Andrea, can I summarize a question for yes. the panelists? Sometimes developers will come before the commission or the city council and they will show certain images of what a building may look like. And at that point, they're really just conceptual drawings. And the question is, um, how, if, if at all, do we ensure that builders conform to what they're proposing? And how does that relate to the guidelines and the standards that we're discussing this evening? Andrea, are you going to answer that or did we lose her? Yeah, I can take a stab at that. From the perspective of what is submitted on a permit. So when a permit is submitted to the city of San Marcos, um, when we're reviewing those, let's say it's um, the topic of building materials. So we have um, essentially plans that we look at that indicate the exact type of materials that are being proposed. And actually, um, with Andrea, their... let me stop you because I think the person asking the question would actually like to ask it themselves. So I'm gonna go ahead and allow Kama Davis, I'm gonna push the button to allow you to talk. You will need to unmute yourself and you have the floor. Thank you so much. And thank you for the presentation and what y'all are doing. Um, so we ran into some problems with the local and they had proposed a building, a mixed use building, as y'all know, that was really nice looking. It had Spanish style. It looks like the surrounding buildings. And then they gave us a concrete square with painted yellow blocks, which does not fit the architectural styles and the standards I think that we should have. So in the scenario that y'all have here, will the city require the developer to stop building and require them to conform to what they've proposed? Yeah, so um, let me address this from the perspective of submitting a building permit, right? So submitting a building permit is essentially a developer or an applicant's official submittal for what they would like to propose. Um, it's not at the conceptual stage anymore. It is um, really architectural drawings of what they would like to propose. So at that time, yes, if it is proposed as a certain material that they are showing on their diagrams, um, that is what needs to be implemented. And that, that is what is, will, will be implemented. And that's something that staff checks on, um, of course, through various inspections that numerous inspections that really occur throughout the development process. 
We also have Diana, um, Diana Baker has her hand raised. Um, I'm gonna allow you to uh, talk. Yeah, you have the floor now. Okay, thank you. Um, let me ask you this. Could, can the guidelines be codified when it comes to setbacks and specifically set, setbacks next to historic uh, sites and landmarks? Sounds like you're asking if the guidelines can be codified into standards if they're near a, uh, a, a residential site or a historic site, something like that. Yes. So right now, we really differentiate between the standards and guidelines, um, I, specifically for the topic of transitions. So if there are, um, if there is a project that is being built next to a historic landmark, local, state, or national, uh, next to a residentially zoned property, single family six or single family R, um, or to a historic district, we have codified our transition standards, um, which you'll, you'll be able to look at a little bit more. We have codified um, the step downs, the step backs, all of that is within our standards. Um, in addition to that, as Nora mentioned a little bit in the guidelines, um, he presented two images of um, some buffers between a new project and maybe a residential neighborhood or something like that. Um, in our code for um, those buffers, those um, essentially landscape transitions, that is also something that is codified um, in our code as part of um, our landscaping section that exists today. So um, hope that answers your question um, for the purposes of the transitions piece. Can, I, can you hear me now? What about uh, something that is close to a landmark? You said you said you have codified those already? Yes, ma'am. And I can actually, um, if it's helpful, really quickly, I'll just go back and show the map just so we can all see it together. So this map here is, um, it's a map that's in our code today, but we actually expanded it a bit to really show where we would be codifying the neighborhood transition standards. So everything you see that is in blue is a property um, today based off of where historic districts are today, where uh, residential zoned properties, where local, state, and national landmarks today are. Any property that is adjacent to or across the street would um, be required to and state one of these neighborhood transition standards. Um, so we've indicated those properties in blue. And then on this map, any of the stars that you see are the local state historic landmarks. Um, so that is something that, that we have codified, at least for this particular um, code standard. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Do we have any other questions? Um, we are gonna move on to um, a few polling questions, but is there any more open discussion questions? And I also want to um, state that Marsha and, and I keep sort of uh, referring to our follow-up survey, um, we really encourage you all to take the follow-up survey, and that's where we'll be. You'll be able to really write down a lot of these pieces of information that we'll be able to um, keep track of and, and tabulate and use them um, when we're considering uh, changes to these in between now and and January, February, March. So. All right, well, if we don't have any more questions, we're gonna just go ahead and start uh, moving to our first polling question. Um, so if you guys were on the call at the beginning, we practiced our polling questions, uh, but it is fairly easy. Um, I'm gonna let Marsha just go ahead and introduce the question and I will start it when she's ready for me. Perfect, so as Andrea mentioned, um, these questions are these are our high level questions. Then the online survey will have some more detailed questions. You'll see these same questions in the online survey as well. So we'll have a series of answers for you to select from here. But if you have some detailed written responses that you wanna include, make sure you go to the online survey to do that. So our first question for tonight is, do you think the recommendations that we presented tonight will help in maintaining downtown character and new development? So we know that these are high level recommendations we've given to you tonight. You haven't seen every single recommendation in both documents, but from what we've shown you so far, do you agree, somewhat agree or disagree maybe that these recommendations will help maintain downtown character? 
while we have this poll up, I'll just say that if anybody is having issues with any of the polls, you can go ahead and talk to me in the Q&A. Let me know what kind of device you're on. That will help me troubleshoot for you. Keep this open for a couple more seconds. All right, we'll move to our next polling question. Awesome, so our next question focuses on the design context themselves. So we presented a little bit about how this map has been updated and the design context names have changed. So we're going to show you the question here and then give you a little bit more detail on the next couple slides before we start the polling question. So what we're going to ask you to answer is to what degree do you believe the updated design context names and the goals reflect your vision for downtown? On the next slide, we have a couple call outs for the first of the first two of the five contexts. So for the University Edge, we, we have a series of um, key characteristics and a new vision statement for each one. And these are just a couple of the key pieces. So for University Edge, there's a pedestrian friendly connection between the university and the downtown core. And that buildings might be larger in this design context, but they still should draw upon design traditions. Then moving south to the downtown core, the key pieces are that New development draws closely on design traditions of the downtown historic district and compatibility is really important in this design context. And articulation, massing, scale, and building rhythm that reflect the historic district is also very important. And then finally, pedestrian friendly design is key in the downtown core. For the next three historic or three design contexts, we have West Downtown and this name has been changed if you're familiar with the previous map and it was changed from the residential transition edge to now being called West Downtown. And the key thing here is that new buildings create a transition from more intense development that's in the downtown core to lower density residential neighborhoods that are west of the West Downtown boundary. And the next one is the transit neighborhood. This name was also updated from transit oriented design and this, this area focuses on taller buildings and higher density that are appropriate if they include human scale elements and that design traditions from the core are still very important for this design context. And then finally, the South Down Down design context was updated from the approach. And here we're highlighting that new development honors the culture and history of the area and provides a preview of downtown as you're coming off the highway moving towards the downtown core. And that larger new development here is focused on the two main corridors, Guadalupe and LBJ streets. So with those in mind, the new names and some of these key features of the design context, do you agree that these reflect your vision for downtown? And again, when you Take this online, you'll have an opportunity, say if you select somewhat reflect, you'll have an opportunity online to say what you might change for one or all of the contexts. Marcia, can you elaborate on what you mean by human scale elements? Yeah, so we heard a lot in the initial outreach of these really tall, large buildings that when a pedestrian walks by them, there's nothing to relate to. So there's no windows or storefronts or even just articulation that helps create a scale that you can relate to as a human who's, you know, between five and six feet tall and not 12 feet tall. So incorporating some of those elements on larger buildings, like we're saying here for the transit neighborhood is really key on the ground floor, um, even though they might be a lot bigger than what you would see in West downtown, for instance. And I see we have a hand raised. If you want to enter your question into the chat for now, otherwise there will be an opportunity later for some more open discussion. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll. Thank you guys. <laughs>
Okay, so our third question for tonight is how helpful do you think these recommended changes to the standards and guidelines will be in achieving your vision for downtown? So a little similar to the last one, but as a more holistic perspective on your vision for downtown, do you think that they'll be very helpful, somewhat helpful, maybe you're neutral on this, or they're not going to be helpful at all? All right, I'm going to go ahead and end this poll. Okay, question four. To what degree do you believe new graphics will assist in making the standards and guidelines understandable and easy to interpret? We showed you some of those new graphics tonight and you'll have an opportunity with the online survey to click on some links to see some additional graphics for other topics. But based on what you've seen tonight, do you think that the new graphics will be very helpful, somewhat helpful, you're neutral, or not helpful at all? Go ahead and end that one. Okay, so our last question for the poll tonight is to what degree do the standards and guidelines cover the design topics you hope to see? On the next slide, because we just highlighted a few key ones, the next slide shows a list of all the topics in both documents that we've provided recommendations on. We obviously did not go over all of these tonight. And as it says on the slide, you can look into all of these topics and the recommended changes in the PDFs that are online right now. You can see, see that there are ones we've highlighted, but ones like transparency we didn't go over tonight, the blank wall area requirements we didn't. There's a lot of new topics in the design manual, especially at the end there. Um, strategies to define the street wall of a forecourt, improving existing front setback. Nori referred to those, but we didn't show any of the new graphics or guidelines that go with them. So just from your knowledge of what we presented tonight, and then from seeing these lists, do you believe that these cover what you would hope to see in the recommended changes to the standards and guidelines? So we'll start the poll and you can let us know if you think they're covered if you think they're somewhat covered or they don't cover. And again, you can definitely let us know in written comments on the online survey if there's something you think is missing that should have been included in these lists. Alrighty, let me go ahead and end that one. All right, uh, first off, I appreciate you all um, helping, helping us with your questions, um, asking good questions, and um, really being here with us as we kind of go through such a technical document. Um, we do understand it, it is technical. Um, you know, we carry around the development code and design manual all the time, um, but I know it, um, I hope we're doing a good job of articulating that. And uh, as Marsha mentioned, we have the full red line for you so you can see exactly what's been added, exactly what's been removed, um, and really just sort of a summary of it in the follow-up survey. Um, and then the other thing is too, we're always here for questions and, and I'll kind of go over some of our outlets for questions here. 
So we uh, really do encourage you to take our follow-up survey. Uh, we'll be sending that to you tomorrow. Um, we'll be posting this entire workshop onto our website. So if you have any friends or family or anyone you know that wanted to attend but um, wasn't able to, um, please um, encourage them to uh, take a look at the workshop video because they'll be able to kind of hear some of the discussion and you can really open that workshop video up in a new tab as you're taking your virtual follow-up survey. So that might help um, really get you through the survey and provide some just guidance. So check that um, in your inbox tomorrow. We'll be sending you all um, as participants a direct link and then we'll be posting that onto our website. Um, the survey will end on December 21st, um, so we wanted to end it uh, right before Christmas to um, give you guys enough time, but uh, make sure it's on your to-do list. The last thing I wanted to um, let you all know is tomorrow we actually have a uh, joint planning commission and city council workshop that we're hosting um, tomorrow at five o'clock. So this is something that you all can tune in if you want to hear some further discussion on these topics. You can watch it on our website or it's also always on um, Grande and Spectrum on some of the local channels. So if you go to your website, um, we'll be able to have all of that information posted as well. There's also Facebook events. Um, if you're on Facebook, you can grab it that way as well. I did just want to briefly um, go over the um, sort of we're at the end phase or middle end phase, I suppose, of our project. Um, in December, we'll be closing the online survey and really then starting to synthesize all of the results we've received from the outreach. Um, so we'll be really taking a look at all of the different events that we've hosted and different feedback we've received. Um, we'll discuss the results and um, we'll be working with, with Nori and Marsha to think about any updates that need to occur um, based off of what's proposed now. We'll start to create our final recommendations to the standards and guidelines in January, and we'll be starting to move to um, adoption phases. So the um, changes will be going to the Planning and Zoning Commission so that they can be considered by that body, um, an appointed body by City Council. And then in March, um, we've got it scheduled to go to City Council um, in order for them to hear it on first and second reading. If you want to receive project updates, if you go to our website, uh, we actually have a link so you can sign up for our planning newsletter is one way um, to receive updates. We send those out monthly and sometimes more often if we've got a lot of projects going on. So you can certainly sign up and we'll be able to always see what's going on when things are to be considered at meetings, that kind of a thing. And then in the meantime, if you have any comments, if you have questions, you can email us at planninginfo at sanmarcostx.gov. Um, we'll be able to, again, kind of tabulate those and also add it to, um, to our community input that we've received. Um, and so with that, I really appreciate you all taking the time to be here. Um, and we really look forward to receiving your input in the next couple of weeks on that follow-up survey. And so um, with that, I just want to say bye, everybody, and thanks for being here. Thank you. Yes.